this alliance with the state. And so when we look at how this church developed, we say, well, did they accept the Nicene Creed? We'll ask that in a couple classes. And um, the answer is, well, yes, but they did it on their own terms, their own way of discussing things. And uh, it was proposed by the West. They knew of it. They said, okay, the Western church accepted this. Do you think this is true? And they had their own process of going through this, right? Process of canonization and other processes, right? So the ultimate lost Christianity, another scholar, Sebastian Brock, who's an Oxford scholar, says here is a genuinely Asian Christianity. And so this is, this is indigenous Asian Christianity, which is free from the specifically European cultural, historical, and intellectual trappings that have become attached to the mainstreams of Christianity with which we are familiar today. Right? So they did not speak Latin. These guys didn't know Latin at all. Right? Uh, they were speaking Aramaic. They were speaking the language of Jesus. And they translated other languages. We'll see this in a moment. But um, different cultural contexts. They were using terms like Tao in China. The Tao became flesh, as opposed to the Logos became flesh. Different cultural contexts, genuinely Asian. And uh, we can see this as they expand out. We won't talk about their full expansion today, but this is one I find particularly interesting. That this church was established in Tibet in the early 200 CE, right? Before Buddhism showed up in the 600s, right? So Christianity was in Tibet before Buddhism, and we find inscriptions of crosses in uh, the language Sogdian carved into a large boulder on an ancient trade route in Tibet. One of them says, uh, talks about Jesus and how in the year 2010, Nasfarn came from Samarkand as an emissary of Christ to the Khan of Tibet. So you think about this, Right? This isn't a language, this isn't Greek, this isn't Aramaic, this isn't Latin, this is Sogdian, right? And uh, the missionary, the emissary sent out from there, right? Samarkand. You think Jerusalem's over here, right? And, uh, you know, India's here, there's, uh, there's China, there's Tibet, and the missionary is sent from the middle of Asia, already established in a different language. And someone decided to write an inscription on a huge boulder. You can see the boulder there and, and the building next to it for scale, um, which is behind the boulder, right? What's going on here? There's a very early Christian presence. Uh, a lot of this history, though, was lost. We find archaeology like this. And this is an interesting um, image of... Um, an Eastern Christian church celebrating Palm Sunday. And they're wearing saffron. The priest is wearing saffron robes, which the Buddhists took up that practice as well. Right? Christians did it first. Right? Um, the first archaeological evidence of anyone wearing these sort of robes in worship. And they spoke languages of the cultures they interacted with. Uh, the worship language was the language of Jesus, Aramaic. But then, you know, they also knew Greek. But then... Persian was a language they wrote and talked about in, uh, sometimes translated scriptures into Turkish, Sogdian, Chinese, Sanskrit, and other languages, um, but not Latin. Interestingly, if you know Mongolian, if you know Mongolian script, it's actually Aramaic, right? So the Mongolian script used today is based on the Aramaic script. You, must, you might ask, why? Why do Mongolians use Aramaic to write down their language? The answer is, these Christians have made such incredible inroads that um, that's what, that's who wrote down the language, right? Engaged in dialogue with the various religions, not just Judaism, but uh, Taoism, which was in China, Zoroastrianism, which was in Persia, Buddhism, which was emerging from India, and uh, Hinduism as well, Confucianism in China, and when Islam arose and started to spread out to the East, these Christians would dialogue with Muslim leaders as well. And we have this correspondence, very interesting correspondence, very interesting way of presenting Jesus to these cultures. Um, so we can sum this up by talking about this church as at least as significant as the church in the West, but I would argue perhaps even more significant in terms of 
ge geographical expanse and population, right? For most of Christian history, the Eastern Church, the Apostolic Church of the East, had more Christians and covered more of the globe, right? Up to, you can see, even to the point of the Reformation, right? And then some key things happened a little, a little bit before the Reformation. Power structures change, and this church starts, starts to get immensely persecuted. Uh, it even happens before the Reformation, but it starts to get systematically destroyed over centuries to, to today. It's really, uh, you know, there's still millions of Christians in this tradition. It might be like 60 million Christians or something, but it's a very small remnant of what it was, even in the 1900s. I think about the Armenian, Armenian genocide in Turkey. Right. Millions of Christians killed, Armenian Christians. Uh, and this was, you know, this is what this was a trend that happened starting centuries earlier. Jenkins, who's a historian, says we cannot understand Christian history without understanding the Church of the East. If you think you're a Christian historian, if you've never heard of this church, you're not a Christian historian. Right? That's what Jenkins would say. If you think you're an Asian historian and you've never heard of this church, you're not an Asian historian. Because right, you also can't understand the history of Asia without understanding this church because of its ignorance. Where did the Mongolian language come from? Why was it written down in Aramaic? Well, it's not just a coincidence, right? Uh, who was Genghis Khan? Who was his favorite wife? Well, she was a Christian of the Apostolic Church of the East. Right, so important stuff going on here. Well, wait, is that Nkumai Khan? His mom? Yes. Right. Important stuff here. Not going to get into the whole history, but if we were to draw a symbolic map, which we see here is a symbolic map of the early church from, um, you know, America's on there. So this is, you know, after America was, was um, you know, known by Europeans. We find Jerusalem is the center of the Christian world, not, uh, not Rome. And I think this is a nice symbolic map if you want to have an image in your head. The geography as you can tell, it's way off. But I don't, think, I don't think it's because the person didn't know much about geography. But uh, this person is saying, okay, what's the real center of the world? And uh, it's Jerusalem, right? And he sees these three continents as more or less equal. Europe, Africa, and Asia are seen as equal players in this growth of the early Christian church. You can say equal authority. Um, I, I like this vision of the church. And um, this, is, this is a vision I think is more true of the history. So we ask some questions. Well, who was Jesus? Who was Jesus in the West? Who was Jesus in the East? And what they see as salvation? We'll talk about this. In the West, we find very early evidence that Jesus, the Messiah from Nazareth, was seen as God. Right? Jesus is praised as God, worshipped as God, uh, explicitly talked about as God. We go back to one of these people we talked about, Ignatius. Right, Ignatius was one of these first Christian uh, disciples of a disciple. And he says, There is one physician who is both flesh and spirit, both made and not made, God existing in flesh, true life and death, both of Mary and of God, even Jesus the Messiah, our Lord. And this is a letter to the church of the Ephesians, which is the same Ephesians church that Paul is writing to. And um, you know, within not very long after Paul, and uh, he's saying, yes, Jesus is God existing in flesh. There's no doubt in this early church that Jesus is God and um, but also fully human. Right? Already you have, uh, there's no doubt about who Jesus is. And uh, today, that's still the Christian view of Jesus, God in the flesh, right? human and God. We can turn to the East and look at the Acts of Thomas and the Aramaic version. And Thomas, praying with his disciples, says, Come, thou holy name of Christ that is above every name, um, praises Christ as God in this book, in the communion service. It's very explicit, again, going back to the one of our earliest sources of the church in the East. And Christ is called real man or real human and real God. <coughs> So both somehow existing together. Christ is praised as the Lord of all, and Christ is praised as the sovereign Lord of the universe and of heaven. Well, that's only something you say about God, right? Uh, sovereign Lord of the universe and heaven? 
you're giving this praise to just a man? No, that's not what they're doing. So we say, okay, who is Jesus? Well, this is how they saw Jesus in terms of a relationship with God. But how does Jesus factor into salvation? And this is where it gets interesting, I think, from our context. Because uh, whether you're Catholic or Protestant, you read these early Christians and you find, oh, they're not exactly perhaps what you might think about in terms of questions of salvation. We can look at someone like Clement, again, who was in Rome, uh, followed Peter in Rome, and uh, also a disciple Paul. He says, therefore, brethren, by doing the will of the Father and keeping our flesh holy and observing the commandments of the Lord, we too will obtain the life of the age to come. Well, he's using the same phrase that we were talking about that the early Jews used to talk about the kingdom of God and what is, what's the goal. Rabbi, good teacher, how do I inherit the life of the age to come? Well, you know the commandments. And uh, here we have Clement saying, well, the commandments, but there's another word in there, the commandments of the Lord. Well, who's the Lord? Jesus, right? So now we're getting more specific. We're talking about Jesus here. Ignatius, too, says Christian faith cannot do the works of unbelief, nor unbelief the works of faith. The tree is made manifest by its fruit. So those who profess themselves to be Christians will be recognized by their conduct. It is better for one to be silent and be a Christian than to talk and not be one. A huge part of their focus here is, are you living out your faith? Yes, you say you have faith. But are you living it out in love? In obedience to Christ. If not, then stop talking and start doing it. Right? Because this already was a problem. People, eh, I'm a Christian. Why am I living like you are? And this is not, you know, this, they didn't invent this, this, you know, Christians of this age didn't invent either. Read any, any of Paul's letters and you will find the same struggle. Right? Or James, you know, faith without works is dead. But even the demons believe Jesus is Lord. That's not much of a compliment, right? Um, not a new problem, still going on. The point is, are you living it? Ignatius, those who profess to be Christ will be recognized by their actions. For what matters is not a momentary act of professing faith, not your moment of conversion. That's not what matters. But being persistently motivated by faith in our actions. Right, and I highlight the interactions. Well, faith, it's not that faith isn't important. That's the beginning, but it's not the point. Right? Are you motivated in your actions by your faith? Polycarp, disciple John, for he who raised Jesus from the dead will raise us also if we do his will and follow his commandments and love what he loved, refraining from all wrongdoing. What's interesting is the role of love here, the role of conduct, and the role of faith. So salvation is, you can say, much more holistic, as they talk about it, than some of us might talk about it today, not being necessarily in this room, but, uh, you know, you could say certain elements of the church, right? You might say, well, I, you know, I had my confession of faith, and I don't need to do anything. Well, these folks would have a problem with that. Um, we could turn to the East and say, well, do they have a different view of salvation from the church of the West? I would say not really, but the emphasis is somewhat different. Salvation is a journey, not an event for them. It's a process. And uh, in this process, you become one with Christ through the mysteries. And what's interesting is the mysteries, they talk about the sacraments. They, they use the Aramaic for mysteries. Uh, and uh, this is baptism, communion, and other sacraments. It starts with baptism, and what's really interesting about the early church, and this is in the West too, but uh, you know, I'll focus on this in the East, is when you get baptized, as an adult, you still have godparents. Who are your godparents? Well, they are your mentors, people mature in the faith, who live a Christian life, typically not related to anyone in your family, and uh, you, st you st hang out with them for two years, considering, is this faith for me? You learn about it, you try to um, you know, live it, and then you make a decision. Am I going to be baptized? After two years of being mentored by these folks, these folks act as your sponsor and your continued mentors after you're baptized. They walk with you in this journey. Right? This is a very intimate, very accountability-focused relationship. 
And you couldn't enter the church without this relationship, right? So everyone would have a mentor, a godparent, when they're baptized, or, or sometimes two godparents, not necessarily married, um, you know, sometimes just one. And uh, you know, if you just had one, it would be of the same sex. If you had two, then you know, they, they'd choose a uh, you know, man and a woman to help you in different aspects of your life. Right? So you'd always have someone to talk to about relationships and stuff like that. And uh, God parents your guides and mentors, and the path of salvation was seen as marriage, a sanctified marriage. You are Christ's spouse. You're going to marry Jesus in this baptism service. So wedding premarital counseling was what godparents would do. Are you ready to marry Jesus? Are you ready to be a faithful, loving spouse with Jesus? To take him seriously, to respect him, right? So you're doing your vows with Jesus. Your godparents would help you with these vows. And this was serious business, right? Uh, I'm trying to imagine how we might do this today. And the whole congregation, too, right? We still do this. We make vows, but we don't sign the names on them. Maybe Andrew should have, uh, you should turn, you know, have everyone sign when they, you know, I do by the help of God. <laughs> All right, now, put your signature on there, right? Um, more serious business. How many would sign? See. Maybe we should do that. That'd be interesting. Um, prerequisite for marital communion is living in obedience with, in, to Christ in love and faithfulness to Christ. And the metaphor here is marriage. Interestingly, uh, in the communion service, the Holy Spirit is seen as, uh, as called um, the, the, um, the cleansing fire and is seen as being present in the bread or brooding. Actually, the, the word is the Holy Spirit is brooding over, in, and through the bread, right, which is straight from Genesis, right, this idea of the Spirit as a, a bird brooding over the waters, um, you know, the very nurturing term, but also being present in the bread, and the bread is called the coal fire, right, and this term coal fire is like the coal taken from the fire and um, you know, put on the lips of the prophet to make him clean, and so there's, you know, there's something going on significantly in the bread, but it's not you know, it's not a Western understanding of communion. It's different. Uh, interestingly different in the context of marriage. So we can sum up both East and West by talking about true faith in Jesus. It has to do with faithfulness. Um, we can say that faithfulness entails obedience and love. And in the East in particular, this has to do with marriage to Christ. A Christian is thus saved through faith. It starts with faith. But faithfulness, do you really have faith if you're not faithful? Your early church, early church would say, no, if you're not faithful, you don't have faith to begin with. Um, obedience and love is the point, is the telos, is the goal of all of the instruction that they're giving. Um, but you also find in the New Testament, right? These folks are not, you know, nothing, not actually saying anything new. If you go back and read your New Testament, it's surprising to say, oh, I thought this was a crazy idea. Oh, salvation is a marriage. And then you read, oh, the church is the bride of Christ. Not so crazy, right? It was there in my Bible all the time. And I never really thought about it that way. This is how God makes Christians righteous and just in and through the Messiah Jesus, our faithfulness. And Jesus' faithfulness to us is what has us, you know, helps us to walk this path and become, you know, to conquer our sin, become righteous, to become just, a life, a life journey of virtue and love is imperative for Christian salvation in these traditions. And importantly, and they're very explicit about this, salvation is not about mere mental assent or knowledge. That's what it's, it's about, agnosticism, right? Gnosis is knowledge. If you have special knowledge of Jesus and you know who he is and you think that saves you, then you're agnostic. You're not a Christian. And this was... The debate that emerges uh, in the next generation of church, because you already have these folks saying, you're saved through what you know, not what you do. Knowledge is what saves you, not love, right? And this is not a Christian view, and, uh, but many Christians follow this path who, you know, these early church Christians would say, well, when they go down the road of knowledge, they're leaving the road of love, right? So, um, you know, knowledge puffs up, right? And love is not like knowledge. So we can uh, talk about some of this and um, try to think about how we would you know, think about this in our own lives, in our own faith. 
First question, how is your own understanding of salvation similar to or different from that of the first generation of Christians after the apostles? Maybe you already like the marriage metaphor that's in the New Testament, and you think, oh yeah, you know, like maybe it wasn't your understanding, but it is now. Or maybe you've already seen salvation as a journey rather than an event, so you're not very different. Or maybe you always thought of salvation as, well, I'm saved when I converted to Jesus, and um, maybe that's a difference. So you think about how are you similar or different to these early Christians in your view of salvation. Second question, do you know any Christians who self-identify as Christians and yet are not living in a virtuous or loving way? And, I, and or even trying. They don't even care to be virtuous and or loving, but they say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Um, how do you think the first Christians would respond to such persons? Right, so you can imagine um, these first Christians and what they wrote from what you know, and say, how do you think they respond would you agree or disagree with their response? And third question, which will get us into some stuff we'll talk about next week, is um, first Christians, folks like Clement, are our main source for knowing which writings of the apostles are genuine, because these are disciples of the apostles. They quote things as genuine, you know, document that John wrote, and you say, okay, this guy's a disciple of John, and um, he's quoting this as a writing of John, so this would seem to be an authoritative witness to Jesus, as best as we can tell. But uh, do you think this means that their theological views should also be taken seriously? Right? If you take their understanding of the New Testament seriously, does that mean that we have to take their theology seriously? And then think about why or why not. Right? If you think, no, you know, uh, maybe you have a different view of the New Testament. Maybe you've never thought about how the New Testament has emerged and this is your first time, so that can also come into the discussion. And hopefully, yeah, you know, we'll spend, uh, we'll spend about 10 minutes and start a little bit later, but let's do 10 minutes and then five minutes of, of communal discussion and then, uh, yeah, see where that goes. Okay. Sorry, <laughs>